I don't know how many of you have been to St. Thomas or not, but St. Thomas is just a beautiful place to be. It's one of the um, stops in the, the um, on ships. tours, cruise ships, that type of thing, and it's just a, a beautiful place. Um, St. Thomas has around uh, or a population of about 50,000, and it has a land area of 32 square miles. <laughs> And, very important now, <laughs> hurricane season is July to October. <laughs> Didn't know that before, um, and nor did I care at the time. So, um, I had been to St. Thomas a, a couple of times and absolutely loved the beaches there. So, I, I went with a gal named Angie, Angie Thompson, or not Angie Thompson, Zitting. Angie Zitting. And um, she was here a few months ago, and she said, Lohan, why don't we go back to St. Thomas? I said, oh, that would be kind of fun. Let's, let's think about doing that. And so that same day, I went, I got online and looked on eBay, and I was able to get a, a week in St. Thomas for a very, very reasonable um, amount. So, bought it. And then we thought, oh, let's get a couple more people to go with us, and then it won't cost us so much. So, thought, who likes to go to the beach but Michelle? Like so beach. my cousin Michelle um, said she wanted to go, and then my friend Angie um, Zitting's mother went also. So that's um, just a really, really brief introduction as to why and how we ended up going to St. Thomas. Now. Um, we had heard the possibility of there being a hurricane before we went to St. Thomas. But all I had heard before we left was there was a possibility of a hurricane and it would be down. Skip, skipping, skipping by us, won't be very much. Yes, or it might be affecting the Leeward Islands. At the time, I thought the Leeward Islands was the name of islands. <laughs> and I thought, well, poor Leeward Islands. <laughs> not having a clue at the time that that was referring to the position and that St. Thomas is certainly considered, if you look up on um, Wikipedia, they're part of the Leeward Islands. So <coughs> so um, we were, we heard a little bit about it, but but um, again, not, not too terribly concerned. Now, um, we all ended up in St. Thomas on, on Saturday. We had a couple of days where we we um, well, we went to Megan's Bay Beach one day. Then we went to a timeshare presentation for um, <laughs> one more for one morning, so we could get that really important um, prepaid gift card. <laughs> and then we kind of just sort of hung out for for a day. So um, the. We were hearing a little bit more about this hurricane coming. Not from anybody at the resort, at Wyndham Resort, not at all. There was no urgency at all anywhere on the island or anywhere. Nowhere. We um, heard things from the taxi drivers. We also heard things from like the maintenance person in the resort, but nobody was concerned. So I was getting a little bit concerned, and I had... Um, Let's see, so I ended up, oh, uh, let's see, um, I, got, I got really, really concerned, and since you can very well see, I don't remember really well, so I wrote it down, <laughs> wrote my feelings down while I was over there. Um, when we heard that the hurricane was definitely coming and was going to be huge, I was very concerned because our resort was, was right on the water. We were on the top floor but it was still concerning to me. No one else seemed to be worried. I asked the taxi drivers, the maintenance people, and the front desk where the best place in the resort would be. And either they said, well, where you are right now is good, or wherever you feel most comfortable. <laughs> I mean, those were since really the responses that we got. I Googled the LDS branch and got the branch president's name and called him. He was, or texted him. He was really nice and he said to keep in touch. And then after another day of, again, not hearing anything, I um, was becoming really panicky. And it, it wasn't a, a real panic attack, but there was just so much turmoil as to what we should do. 
um, or where we ought to go. So I texted the branch president and he said, go to the shelter for sure. And then he named which one and where it was located. So I asked if that was his opinion or if that was his um, advice as my ecclesiastical leader in St. Thomas. And he said it was definitely because he was um, acting as the ecclesiastical leader. So immediately I felt very, very calm. And prior to that, um, my mouth was so dry that I could barely swallow. And I'm just not prone to being nervous. <laughs> but I was just so dry and I, I was just so concerned. But as soon as, as soon as he told me that, I thought, okay, I know what I'm going to do. So we were just coming back from um, a, a little outing to get food for the hurricane and water. He was just going to drop us off at, the, at our resort. So I turned to the group and said, I'm going into the Red Cross shelter. If any of you guys want to go with me, you're fine to come. If you don't want to, that's just fine too. And the taxi driver said that we were nuts, but I didn't really care. So I asked him if he would come back and pick us up. Michelle decided she was going to go um, to the shelter with, with me. And he said, sure, I'll, I'll come back, pick you up. He came back. We went to the shelter. Nobody was there. It definitely was not set up to be a shelter. And so we thought, ah, we'll just, we'll just stop. We'll just, he can just drop us off and we'll just wait till somebody shows up. And the taxi driver said, ah, no, you can't do that. It's, it's not safe for you guys just to be sitting here. So I said, well, the um, hospital is just right across the street. We can just go there and wait. And the taxi driver said, okay, that'll work. So that's what we did. Anyway, so I said, we looked at the, the hospital there and we thought, well, that's probably the safest place we should be. It's a hospital. And I'm a registered nurse, and so I thought, we can offer our service. Maybe they'll give us a room and I'll offer our service and I can help them and see what we could do. We thought that would be a great idea, so we went into the hospital, very secure. Like I said, you had to check in. Like I said there was people at the front gate. You know, they said, you know, we told them why we were there. We said we we want to help out, and they sent us to the the human resource. They said go up there. That, they'll like that. Go up there. And so we said, can we leave our suitcases and everything that we had? And they said that would be fine. It should be safe there. So we left all of our stuff down by the desk went up and found HR and it took a while for them to come. They were in meetings with all the big wigs of the whole city and so we... They were actually concerned about the um, hurricane even though <laughs> nobody else seemed to be. <laughs> and so we thought, well, I said, the so we waited for a while and then a, a couple of people came in and said, you know, that's great that you want to volunteer and Loianne volunteered. She said, I'll do whatever. We just, we just hands, want something, I don't care. I just <laughs> don't want to be out in the street. We just wanted to, we thought that would be the safest place for us to be at the hospital and so... They, they were very uh, grateful, and they said, well, you probably don't need anything right now, but here, can we get your names? Most likely we're going to need you tomorrow after the hurricane hits. And we, we gave our names and our numbers, and we went back down trying to figure out where else we were going to go. We were sitting in the lobby. I think that by that time it was only 10 o'clock in the morning, 10.30, 11 o'clock. So we sat in the lobby and we were glued to the TV trying to figure out because the governor was supposed to come on and give speeches on what we were supposed to be doing. We, but every channel we were watching was about Florida and it hitting Florida after it was going to hit us. So we were kind of in a panic. We had to have him change the channel so we could get on the Virgin Island channel. And we sat there most of the day and got to become friends with two of the people at the front desk. I think the one security guard was named Akeem and the other one I can't remember her name, but she was from... Uh, St. Saint, Saint Croix. Saint I said she had wasn't able to, they were evacuating her, yeah. she couldn't get back to there, so she was that she was going to stay and work there on that base. And so after we'd been sitting there and she talked to us and, and I had, we'd seen an article up on the TV that said that there was this company that was supposed to pick up anybody that wanted to go to a shelter, all you had to do was call the number. So we took the number furiously down and we said, that's what we need to do, we'll call this, this by, by trans, we had to call the shelter. And we get on the phone to call him. Oh, okay. Um, okay, so um, I was, you probably think I was just nervous the entire time I was there. <laughs> I wasn't, but I was getting really nervous at, at that point because they were adamant in, at the hospital in the waiting room that, that, that we could not stay there in the, in the hospital. I mean, they, 
we tried to, like Michelle said, we tried to make friends with them, tried to suck up to them, and <laughs> they just would not let us stay. And they, but they were still very nice, but you know, you cannot stay. This is not a shelter. You cannot stay. So I was getting really, really nervous. It was getting later and later, and we just didn't have a plan. The shelter next door didn't seem to be happening, and all I knew was that we were not going to be able to stay at the hospital. And I didn't want to bother the branch president and call him again, um, but I was still really worried. Um, I decided, and so I decided to text my bishop here, Bishop Sharp. And I told him of my situation, and he texted right back and indicated that he had no idea that I was in St. Thomas with a Category 5 hurricane barreling towards us. Um, and he asked if I wanted to have a blessing. And I was a little, little kind of concerned, not concerned, but like, oh, how are you going to do that? Um, but I, I, of course, said, yes, I would like one. And he indicated that he could give me a blessing um, by figuratively putting his hands on my head. So um, he asked if I was ready, and I said, just give me a sec. So I ran into the bathroom, and where I was just all by myself, and then I said, yes, I am ready. So um, he began the blessing by saying that he was figuratively laying his hands on my head. I was so comforted at that moment. And in the blessing, I was told that guardian angels would be attending to me, as well as many loved ones who had passed on before. And I remember the words, I would be blessed with strength, were used many times. And I must say, at that time, I was thinking, oh man, am I going to have to like, pick up a car off me or something? <laughs> <laughs> why, why is he so obsessed with strength here? Because <laughs> I am pretty much a wuss. But I thought, well, if I, if I can always use it, you know, all the more strength that I can get. Um, and then he also said that he felt like I needed to write down the stories that I heard at the, through the, the hurricane. He didn't say at the shelter, but just um, the hurricane. And write down the feelings that I also had with that. And then um, the very most important part to me, and I really didn't think it was coming, but towards the very end of the blessing, he said that I would come home safely and that I still had things to do. And so I would absolutely be coming home safely after, um, after the hurricane. And at that moment, I thought, oh, yes, that is so cool. <laughs> <clears throat> and I knew at that moment, too, I mean, that, that it would come to pass. That, and all, all of my fears vanished. I became calm again. I could think clearly, and I knew that everything was going to be all right. And I was supposed to back to the Vitron, so we'd, we'd called this number, and we were waiting for them to, um, and we got on the phone, and they had no idea what we were talking about. So we, and so the lady at the front desk grabbed the phone and said, you've got to come pick up these two nice white girls that are here at the hospital. <laughs> they didn't want us there anymore. But so she gave them directions, and they, like I said, she took us under their wings, and they came and picked us up. I said, then we went on to um, the shelter. It was the human... Yeah, it was the Hanson Human Resources Building in the middle of town. In the middle of, of town. Like I said, it had bob wires, and it, like I said, it was dark and kind of dreary. It looked like it had already been hit by a hurricane, but we didn't care. Like I said, we didn't know where we were going, so we went in, and there was people from Texas that were on vacation there that were trying to check people in, so, I mean, we felt good about seeing some Texans there. Everyone else, like I said, who else was there? There was lots of people at the shelter already. And then um, we, we got a call from the state president saying that there was a lady that was coming to the shelter with a baby that had called him and she didn't feel comfortable staying there and wondered if we would be okay or if we wanted to go, you know, with them to another shelter. We we didn't know what 
But I kind of knew what, what I wanted to do. I didn't really want to stay at that one, but I didn't want to appear as if I was a snob either. Um, <laughs> I mean, seriously, that was just a real ghetto shelter. <laughs> but also in the blessing, I had been told that I would be able to help a lot of people. And I was, I was looking around, I was thinking, okay, seriously, these people need a lot of help. And a lot of it is not just because of the hurricane. They need help. <laughs> But thought, well, we are where we are. So I said, the, the stake president came, or the stake president, branch president, branch president yeah. came in the building, and he, we said, you, you know, you tell us what we need to do. We're under your direction. And he said, I want you guys to come with us. I feel more comfortable taking you to another shelter closer to my house, so I can keep a better eye on you once the storm's over. So we jumped in the car with um, her name was Denise and her little baby. We had lots of pictures of. I said, and we got in the car and headed towards um, another shelter that we were going to. And I said, it was just crazy. I said, going that way, just trying to find the directions. He, I don't know if he didn't know where the shelter was, but just going down the streets, we were just trying to find the other shelter that he wanted to take us to. And there was one point that, I mean, the, the, the branch president was driving appropriately. There was another car that just came barreling through the intersection and it was almost as if he just passed right through us there was no way that that we really should have that he should have missed us because he just went straight through but we didn't he didn't get hurt didn't get hit very very surprised with that um, when we were at the shelter we met another I wrote another young couple, like I'm a young couple. <laughs> we met a young couple from Salt Lake. <laughs> and they had just gotten there just um, a couple of months ago. And they had they were business owners, and they had, like, Del Sol clothing. And they were really excited about their ventures in St. Thomas. So we kind of hung out with them a little bit. Um... And then, you know, and we took the, and that night we slept a little bit. We we knew when, or we had heard that the um, that the hurricane was supposed to hit at like nine in the morning, and they kept moving it um, further and further. And then Michelle was one of the inner circle because she's an RN, so she got to go to the important meetings that they had with the Red Cross people. And do you want to? Told about that. I said they would, they would have meetings and they would have us look for certain people what we were seeing and like I said what we, the only medications they had were uh, Tylenol and ibuprofen so there wasn't a lot of options to give to people but they said to watch people for blood pressure and stressing out and so I said well, every we'd get together and have little meetings that people they were concerned about and you got to hear kind of what was going on on the outside world and I said what um kind of alarmed me as they said they had updates that St. Martin had just been devastatedly wiped out by the hurricane that was on our way straight to our path and so panic mode like said I went over and I said you know what like told me I, <laughs> not trying to scare but I said I, I just felt like it was a scare like I said I, I just didn't know what to think but I said it was the island that was right by us and it was coming and it was but it was nice to have the information to be in the group and to be able to hear what was going on from all sorts of different people and what was coming. And I had, I was really calm because I'd had that blessing, you know. And um, But when Michelle said that, that St. Martin had just been absolutely obliterated, that's when I really, really, yet again, started to panic. Um, I called Wayne um, because I thought, I mean, that really might be the last time that I'm going to ever be able to um, to see him again. And um, so he was very, very, very reassuring. Um, just spoke for just a couple of minutes. I know Michelle talked to Kimball and gave him some important advice. And um, then we hung up and then we just kind of hunkered down and got ready for the hurricane to strike. That's what when I called Kimball for that, I thought was gonna could be the last time too. I was <coughs> said, I love you so much. Tell the kids I love them so much. I said, make sure. I said, 
that you get all the life insurance, make sure and call my work and get the life insurance <laughs> and spend it wisely. Like I said, we, I told him what I wanted him to spend it on. And I said, <laughs> and then I, um, I told him to please call my boss. I didn't think I, I might not be back to work on the following Monday that I was supposed to be home, so I was to call the boss. But it was very, it was a very surreal, like, I said most of the time said our phones didn't after that our phones didn't work very well and if we could get a text out we'd probably text one out of 25 texts we'd pray that they'd go through and maybe one of them did so our, the communications was getting to be limited about five minutes into the hurricane there was a hellacious noise and it was kind of like a freight train was going across the the um, ceiling and it just was like when boom 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 as loud as you could possibly ever think of a noise could be. And I thought, okay, it's five minutes into this hurricane. The hurricane is, is um, supposed to last about eight hours. And if this is the beginning of it, what in the world is it going to be like in, you know, five hours? <laughs> and we found out later that that particular noise was the air conditioning unit. Um, to, going or coming off of the the roof and when it um, went off the roof it pulled the the cover off of it the roof holes into the roof and so there was really no protection I mean, yes there was a roof on it but nothing really to protect it from the rain so I think we started watching like I said the, <coughs> it was raining pretty hard and we started watching the seal at the ceiling tiles everybody had flashlights and one would fall and then they somebody would grab a garbage can and there would be a waterfall there and then a few minutes later you'd look somewhere else and they did that about eight or nine times and then they finally said we have no more garbage cans <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to have to evacuate somewhere so <coughs> that when they went to go find the key there was yeah I said they went so we were in the cafeteria of the the lunchroom of the school and so we, we they said we have to evacuate you but there's the keys are at the principal's office so Someone ran out in the middle of the Principal's storm. House. Someone ran out in the yeah. middle of the storm and grabbed the set of keys so that we could try and find another classroom or something we could bunker down in. And so they said someone went through the storm and came back and then they opened up another room. It was one of the policemen that actually went to do it, and it was in. I mean, while the storm was absolutely crazy, I mean, craziness. But he cared enough to do his job to to risk his life for everybody um, there at the shelter. Um, now, well, we, we ended up going to the library. And in that particular room, there were a lot of glass windows. And we were smart enough to know we did not want to be near the glass windows, <laughs> but we were also appropriate enough to know that we can't like shove people out of the way so that we don't have to be by the glass windows and they do. So um, we did kind of look around and, and we found a little area that didn't seem to be too bad. So Michelle and I were there, plus a other little couple from Utah and the other um, gal in, in the branch. And the, the windows, I mean, you could see them bouncing back and forth. And we just knew at any moment the, the windows are going to explode. And we'd heard, you know, stories as to what would happen when the windows explode. They could suck you out. Um, the shards, you know, could come on you. We, ha we took our little Red Cross blankets with us um, when we went from one room to the, the other. And it was about 190 degrees with 100% humidity or more. And yet we had our, our, those big wool blankets on over our shoulders just to make sure that if, if the windows broke, we wouldn't, um, wouldn't be hurt or impaled by glass. And during the, I don't know, you know how Michelle, what her feelings were, but I know um, Melissa, my niece, asked when, you know, the, when the hurricane was just in full force, did, was there anybody in particular that I felt might have been there um, with me that had passed on before? And I told her that there really wasn't. Oh, <laughs> maybe I just thought about it. Um, that there really wasn't, be because it was too big for one person. What I did feel were absolute generations 
of ancestors that were there with us, um, just enveloping us in in their arms. Um, it the um, the the day before when um, Bishop had was had given me the blessing, he also sent a a text that had the Tabernacle Choir singing "Abide with Me," and he. And he said that he thought that that might be um, helpful and might help me be calm during the storm. And he also sent a written text, or a written copy of, of the text of Abide With Me, which I thought was a little, like, overkill. But <laughs> <laughs> whatever. Um, so, no, well, yeah, I have to add something, though. But there was a reason, too. Are you tell us? No, I don't know your reason. I know my reason. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yes. And it was even, even tied, too, with that song. So I thought, oh, my goodness. With that song. And, and throw that in. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I understand why you sent the, the song. It was like the written text that I thought was, okay, random. <laughs> but, um, but I tried to listen to the Tabernacle Choir while the storm was raging, but I couldn't. I couldn't hear it. It was so loud. But what I could do was read the text that he had also sent um, to me. So while the storm was, was raging, I was able to read all of the verses and not just some of the lines that I knew anyway. Um, so that was very, very helpful to me and certainly one of God's little, little tender mercies. Um, I think at one point when the hurricane, like the, the, the lady <coughs> that was from the islands, the member that had the little baby, they said she was from there and she had been through hurricanes before, and I guess what kind of set us off was she, she said, you know, she said, if the roofs rip off, you guys should run outside. We couldn't figure out, we didn't want to run outside, no matter, we thought we're going to hunker into, we're going to stay inside no matter what, we're, even if the roof rips off, but I said, it was, we had so many blessings, like I said, such a calming after a while. That yeah. We really did. I mean, it, we were very, very calm. Um... After the hurricane, we were, um, we were still, of course, at the, the school, and we were taking photos. We, were, we weren't allowed to leave the... How long did it end up lasting? Oh, good question. It was like eight or nine hours. Eight or nine hours. Of continuous. And I kept... We, we, were, we, we kept hearing people say, okay, the eye of the, of the hurricane, it's going to be very, very calm. Don't go outside. Because it's going to flip, and it'll be even worse <laughs> going around when it comes around again. And I just never, we never could hear that calm, quiet part. So we just kept thinking, this is going to go on for flipping ever. <laughs> and then it finally did end. We never were actually in the eye. It was the wall of the eye. But it did, it, it was like eight to nine hours straight through, and not just kind of tapering off. It was strong, full bore the entire time. It was the strongest storm in the world's history, of course. <laughs> <laughs> yep, it was the it was it was the strongest um, hurricane to ever hit landfall, and it it really was. <laughs> um, so afterwards, we kind of wandered around. We'd taken some photos prior to the hurricane, and what we saw after outside was absolutely devastating. There was not one single green leaf left on any any tree. There was no grass. There was nothing. Um, I said the buildings on both sides of us, where we had started out, was completely ruined, gone. We're on the other side of where, I mean, just the little library that we're in, we couldn't believe that we lived through that with the building being intact. There, um, we, okay, I, I had the thought about three different times before, or as I was packing things, you ought to take your satellite phone. I thought, well, that's kind of stupid. I've been there a couple of times before, and Sprint worked just fine there. So I have Sprint service. I, I won't take it. Kept thinking, take the satellite phone. I didn't. 
did not take our satellite phone. Um, and then for a short time, Sprint worked. The, um, the Red Cross had to use our phones because they didn't have any phones that worked um, for the storm. And then our, our, um, our cell phones went dead, went dead also. We had several people that came to visit us. One of them was the senator, or one of the senators. And whenever anybody came to visit, they kind of paraded them down to see uh, the two tourists from the Nevada, <laughs> the two white ladies from Nevada. <laughs> and they did that when the senator came through. <clears throat> and he asked, you know, if, if we had any concerns and said, yeah, we haven't heard from our friends. We have no idea how they fared, we, we just have no idea. And he said, well, I live right above that particular resort, so I'll check on them when, you, when, you go, um, when, we, when I go home. And he did. And he tried to call us, but our cell phones didn't work. But we did hear that, that he tried to do that. I said right after the storm, too, I said we were outside and getting some fresh air, I said, because we'd been cooped up for the while. And it was, of course, it was at a school, and there was a big flood in the front and there's poles down so they wouldn't let us step outside to step in anything but we were just kind of sitting there talking just kind of enjoying the fresh air and we looked over and it looked like a big flash and all of a sudden lightning struck the flagpole like 10, fo 10 feet from us gave about everybody heart attacks we couldn't hear very well our hearts and then we thought if we don't die in a hurricane we're going to die by getting struck by lightning but we <laughs> So we didn't want to go outside for a while no, after that. No, we were, we were really nervous. Um, so we and we'll go through some of the pictures um, at, at the end and tell you tell you about them. We've got some pictures of that resort. How at a resort? Yeah, right. The Red Shelter Resort or the Red Cross <laughs> Shelter Resort. <laughs> got some pictures of the shelter and how how it really was compromised. Um, there was a lot of flooding in it and the. FEMA, or I guess it was, it was FEMA that FEMA came, came when in I was down. and said that we couldn't stay any stay there any longer. We had to evacuate. So, in the middle of the night, so I said they they thought we should maybe they could get a bus to get us all out of there, but the power lines were still down everywhere, so they couldn't a bus couldn't go through. So, they had employees of the school come in their private vehicles and load people up. And then we kind of had a train going one by one, following each other to the next shelter that we were going to go to. And we, we got in one of the cars. We were one of the last people to go. And I don't know if our driver didn't follow exactly where we were supposed to go, but he was driving on the streets, and there was, like I said, there, it was chaotic, and there was poles and trees in the road. But we went down one way, and there was a house in the middle of the road block that the roof had fallen, like, completely in the road we were at, so we had to back out and go in thought we were in like a driveway somewhere, yeah, but it was just, just a house that was in the middle somebody's of driveway. the road. So we backed up and it was just scary. Like I said, holding, Loyan had suitcases lent. She couldn't see outside. <laughs> so I'm trying to take pictures as we're going with power lines because he's going all different ways. It was just as scary as the hurricane going through all the power lines. The power lines were down, I mean, everywhere. Across the roads, there were um, trees, all kinds of things. Houses, as she said, in the middle of the road. and. It, it really was very, very dangerous um, to get where we were going. We ended up, um, of course, getting to the next shelter. And they made kind of a big deal to us, saying that the shelter was all ready for us. And It was the same shelter we were going to go to before we went to the hospital that was going to be ready. So we weren't quite sure, but we hoped. So we got in there, and there was no... So no the national, power the was there. Yeah, there's the National Guard had their big trucks there, and there was no power, there no t flushing toilets. There was, I mean, we had to set up in the middle of the night with just the little lights that we had. We did have cots, and we thought, <laughs> okay, this is their idea of preparation. We have cots, <laughs> but we found out, um, or, but they really did that night. They got the the generator going. They worked tirelessly to get those things that we needed. We were just so very, very impressed with with, with all that they that they had done. I said the thing too that we were so impressed with with all the workers. Of course, there are local people that lived in St. Thomas. They weren't concerned about 
what was going on at their house or because we kept saying, how is your house or how's everything? And they hadn't even left to go see how things had fared for them. They were concerned about taking care of everybody at the shelter. It was. They had no idea. One, one of the, like the head gal, had no idea if her home was even there, if her animals were safe, no idea, yet they were there for us. Now, um, Michelle and I both have separate skill strengths. And Michelle's skill, and I mean this with every ounce, is she is an amazing networker. She knows who to talk to, what to say to those people, and just I'm just amazing with that. I, on the other hand, am very good at maybe listening to people, getting some of their stories, um, welcoming, welcoming them to the center. So that's what I did. I, I wrote down their stories, that they, some of the things that they had endured before they came into the shelter, some of their hopes, some of their dreams. A lot of people came in in the middle of the night, and um, I welcomed them you know, the, next, the next morning. <coughs> but Michelle really did have some amazing, um, an amazing role to play. I said, one of them, I said, at the shelter there was only one cell phone plug, one plug that worked in the whole, whole school. And there was a family kind of guarding it like it was their very own. And they wouldn't let people in. And so, Loyan, we had chocolate for the kids, and we just made <laughs> friends. With the, so we could just plug our phones in for five minutes to get 25% on our phones so we could even try and take a text. So I said it was just knowing. And it was really interesting to, to see the different personalities. There were people that were, that were obvious, I mean, had, had some very obvious mental illness. Um, well, oh, one thing that we didn't, do you want to tell about the hospital, how happy we were? We did not. Oh, yes. <laughs> Stay there. All right, so I said, at, of course, when we got done back to the shelter, we found out that the hospital had collapsed, the top three, two or three floors had collapsed in on each other, and they were evacuating people out of the hospital, so we were, for a second, glad we didn't stay at the hospital. <laughs> But um, we were just trying to figure out any way to try to, to get back home because the airports were closed. And, you know, my family would text and say, don't tell somebody you need some diabetic medication or heart medication and maybe they can evacuate you off to the, to the, next, the hospital. <laughs> and so I kept telling them, maybe we should act a little crazy so we, go to the, <laughs> we could go to the behavioral unit. Med and, they, and, and then, of course, the head lady said, there is no BMED anymore. They're probably mingled in here with us already. So enjoy, have a good time. Like. <laughs> <laughs> yep, they just had to. Anybody who was not critical, they had they to. They just let them go. Them. They let them go, and they said, "Here, there's a shelter open down there." And so you kind of look for their wristbands to see who was there. And we, they, they were probably surrounded all by us, and we met some nice people. We really did. Um, we. Part of the destruction that we were able to hear about and see was um, they have, I think, three police stations in St. Thomas. Two of the police stations were absolutely destroyed. The post office was destroyed. Um, yeah, the hospital. Yeah, the hospital. This, one of the stores. And, um, and they ended up having to evacuate some of the, well, a lot of the um, criminals to Puerto Rico and St. Croix so that they would have places to put the, um, the looters and people that were, that were um, up to, to basically no good. Okay, um, as I said a little bit earlier, one of the roles that I functioned in was to do as Bishop had said in the blessing, to get stories, to write things down. So I did that. There was a a gentleman, he was Chinese, and he worked in a Chinese restaurant. And he wanted me to say his name, it was Mr. Wu. He, and, he, and he gave this information to me on September 8th at 10 o'clock. So um, what he told me was he had planned to remain in his home for the hurricane. 
and he, partway through, he knew that it just was not going to be safe. So he went outside. He said he lived five minutes away from the hospital, and so he thought he could go there. <coughs> so the rain penetrated his eyes like daggers, and he couldn't stand up, so he crawled um, as far as he could. He would crawl to a tree, and then he'd hug the tree until he didn't have strength to hang on, or until he did have strength to crawl again. So he'd crawl a little bit further till he got to another tree. He'd do the same thing. And then he started laughing, and he said, and then I went to one and put my arms around it, and then after a minute or two realized this isn't a tree. And he um, realized that he was hu hugging a power pole. <laughs> so he hurried and let go of that and hurried to find another tree somewhere. Um, typically, he said it takes him um, five minutes to get to the hospital. He said it took him 45 minutes to get there. And then when he got to the hospital, um, someone let him in. And he said, Dur this is what I thought was so poignant. He said during the storm, when he was outside, he said he just felt so alone. And when he got to the door, someone let him in. And he said that it was only by divine providence that he was able to find the hospital and um, live through the storm. And he was able to see the hospital as it was deteriorating. And he was able to tell us afterwards about that. He also said that there was a man next to him in um, at the hospital that had also found his way to the hospital during the storm. And he said the guy had owned a boat for 20 years and he wanted to save it. So he stayed on the boat. But then um, when it tipped, then, let's see. Oh, no, when it turned ugly, the mast tipped over, so he had to leave. And he was in the water for 45 minutes. And he grabbed debris to float on. And then he said a wave washed him up onto the shore instead of back out into the, into the sea. And then when he got up, he said all he, all he had on was a T-shirt. So he, said he was just kind of crawling to um, somewhere. And then he said he found a towel lying on the ground. So he got up and he wrapped that around, around himself and then he walked to the hospital. And he was very grateful that he was able to find that towel. <laughs> <coughs> there was a, <laughs> there was a little, a, group of people that came in the next, um, well, that night, and it was just so incredibly sad. They had weathered the, the um, storm okay. They were there for, and worked for Diamond International, I guess there are four stores there on, on the island, and they, they um, were able to weather the storm, they went to bed that night. And there was, there was a woman and her daughter another, and another woman, and then across the hall there was a lady. Two in the morning, one of them um, woke up and smelled smoke. So she jumped up, um, told her friend, they got their IDs, they um, ran out the door, knocked on their neighbor's door, and um, and got out. They saw that the units were on fire. They saw that um, that it started. Well, the generator had um, exploded. had exploded, and so they just saw the fire go all the way up the um, the power lines, igniting all of the units as it went. And um, so they were just kind of watching their home, their apartment burn. And they knew they had to get away, so they always parked in one certain spot um, in the unit, but for some reason they parked in a different spot that night. And as they went down to get their car, they noticed that had they parked in their normal spot, they wouldn't have been able to leave because a tree was blocking that um, driveway or that area. So they got in their car, they drove about a block, and then they were stopped by um, a police car. So three policemen jumped out and pointed guns at them. And they just started to cry, saying, please don't shoot us. And of course, the police would not have shot them, but they thought they might be looters until they actually saw, you know, there was a 14-year-old girl in the car, and, and they definitely were not, not looters. So 
So they were just absolutely beside themselves um, when they came into the shelter. Right. And you want to tell about the couple of people? I said then there was another lady that we talked to. We got to be quite good. <coughs> we have quite a few pictures of their kids. It was She was the grandma, and they were there. And the storm hit, and she had put all the kids, I think there was four of them, in the cupboard in the bathroom. And um, she said to do, she was up in water up to about her neck. And she was holding the window to try and keep the window from blowing in inward. So she was holding up the window, telling the, the grandkids that they needed to stay in this cupboard until after the storm was over. And then she said a comforter floated up in the bathroom. And so she pulled the comforter and said, to the kids, gave the kids the comforter this, that was soaking wet and said, do not come out of this cupboard no matter what until the storm is over. And they they lost everything in their whole house there. Like I said, they had come to the shelter and they, they were kind of close to us, but they, they were, we played with those kids all the time. It was fun to get to know that little family. There was um, one family there who saw a neighbor be sucked out of her, their home, the windows had blown out, and they saw her hang on as long as she could to something in the home, and then she couldn't hang on any longer, and so then she was blown out, and they found her body um, the next day. And there were so many stories like that that, that we heard, but their, their attitudes were very, very, I mean, That's positive. Was, that was so amazing. They'd say, we lost everything, but we're here breathing, and so... That's how we kind of felt like um, we're breathing here too, so. Now, when I was packing um, to go to St. Thomas, I put in some of the weirdest things. And at the time I thought, I don't need this. I've been a couple of times, never have I taken this before. But I thought, yeah, I'll, I'll take it, whatever. Um, so I brought two sleep masks, 800 milligram ibuprofen, Tic Tacs, wet wipes, and about 20 set of earplugs. And each time I put one of those items in, I'd pull it out and say, I don't need this. And then I would put it back in. And um, at the shelter, each one of those items was really, really needed by somebody at the shelter. And um, the gal that was with us from Salt Lake that we kind of hung out with, she said, Ryan, that bag is just like Mary Poppins' bag. <laughs> things just, you keep pulling things out that we need. And, and she really, really was right. And it certainly was not my idea to bring those things. It was God knowing that somebody at that shelter, it would make their lives a little more comfortable. Was it, was it absolutely necessary? No. But it made their lives a little bit better for, for a few brief, brief moments. That Loyanne gave her shoes and clothes, and so I gave a bunch of clothes to the ladies that had lost everything. And before we left, I had fingernail clippers, I had a bottle of Advil, things that you thought were just the craziest things that were in your bag. We just handed them all out, and, say, and they were so grateful for the silliest fingernail clippers. And A few days after, um, after the hurricane had, had gone, then there were some, some volunteers that would come from, from in town and say, you know, what do you need? And I, she was asking me, and I said, you know, we really need some things for the kids to do. There just is not, I mean, yeah, we're here in a school, but we seem to not have access to anything in any of the classrooms. And so we need games, we need um, books, we need things for the kids to do. And then she said, okay, is there anything else you need? And then I said, yeah, there really is something. I need a little container so that I can wash some of my clothes in them. Um, and I was absolutely so eager to have her come back the next day. Um, I would like to say it was so that she could bring things for the kids, but no, it was so she could bring that bucket to me. <laughs> um, but it, it did make me, I mean, okay, I really was afraid that she would forget to bring it. Um, or she couldn't find one. And I learned at that moment how important it is to do things for others and how much something like that can mean to just one person. And when she returned, I was thrilled to see a little gallon Blue Bunny ice cream bucket sticking out of the top of her bag. And I even asked her if I could hug her. I was just so excited to get that little, little container so I could wash my 
one shirt in it <laughs> that I had, which I'd given everything else away. I said some the conditions at the shelter. <coughs> some of the time we had flushing toilets, but most of the time I said there was no flushing toilets at all. And then you had, I think one t one count there was a hundred and eighty people. Yeah. I said that. So it was, we tried to go to the bathroom outside. It seemed a little fresher. But I said well, we actually we would hold it as long as we could yes. hold it, <laughs> and then we'd have to just say, okay, it's time to go and. And we even got into the shelter mentality. We started hoarding, hoarding things, too. <laughs> we, had, we had toilet paper, because they were running out of toilet paper. We'd put it under our shirt and walk out kind of quietly. Because Michelle could kind of get back into the, uh, the, the good stuff. <laughs> so she'd like, go get things and kind of hide them and, and bring them in. But, so we were not immune to the shelter mentality. Um, the, the Red Cross um, people tried so hard um, with, with so very, very little. It's just difficult for me to even convey how, how much they did for us. Um, okay, I received a random, rather lengthy text from the bishop one day indicating that he felt impressed to tell me to stay calm and that all would be well to stay with the Red Cross until we knew we could definitely leave and to just stay calm and carry on. And that needed to be my mantra, to stay calm and carry on. And I thought that was totally unnecessary because I was as calm as I had ever been. I mean, I really was calm. I was just doing my thing, welcoming people to the shelter and um, just really, really calm. But I thought, yeah, I probably think I'm just nervous because... I'm over there and not home or whatever. Um, and I did appreciate the fact, Bishop, that you were thinking of me, and but you were kind of wrong about my emotional state. <laughs> well, next day at 9 o'clock in the morning, we got a short text from one of our friends, the first communication that we had gotten from her um, after, since we left. And she said, they are flying us out today. We'll let you know when we get to the airport. And I texted back numerous times, but I didn't get any more info. That was just it. She was just silent from then on. And, um, and then at 1.30, there was another text. And she said, maybe not. Thought we'd see you at the airport by now, packed and waiting. And I responded with texts like, are you at the airport right now? Um, by... Or, Packed and waiting? What do you mean? Do you mean that the airport is packed and you're waiting? Or your bags are packed and you're waiting? What are you, what are you talking about? And I was just getting frantic. I was just kind of going crazy, trying to find out what was going on, where they were. Had no idea where they were. Like um, I said, we couldn't figure out, because they, they told us the airport was going to damaged beyond, no one had even looked at their airport, so we thought, where are they flying out of? What We want to get on the plane. Where are we, where are we going? And then I thought, I've got to, I've, or, or no, I, I found out from some friends here that, sh that they had talked to our friend's daughter, and she was at a shelter. Well, I knew she wasn't at all, they weren't at our shelter, so I thought they must be down to the other shelter. And I was just going crazy trying to find a way down to that shelter because nobody, I mean, they couldn't get phones to, or phone calls through to the other shelter. And I was just getting more and more frantic. So I got somebody from the Red Cross to take me down to the other shelter. And that was such a frightening experience. There were armed National Guardsmen all over the city. There were, I mean, a huge police um, contingency. There was, there were people getting food from the fire station. Um, everything was just really kind of crazy. There were lines that were about four blocks long for gas. And, and I just felt very grateful that nothing happened to us when we were, you know, on our way or coming back. Got to the shelter. No, she wasn't there. Never had been. <clears throat> and so that's when I said, okay, Sue, um, will you at least call 
like call our congressman, call a senator, call somebody, I really think that they have forgotten us. Um, we're, we're at the shelter, we're the only tourists here. I don't think we're ever going to get out because nobody knows we exist. There was a phenomenal lack of communication between all the different agencies. And I knew that the last thing the Red Cross had on their mind was to get these two nice white ladies out. <laughs> um, they were just trying to get food for the, for the people there. And then um, I got another, another text from Bishop, and he said, let's see, um, he said, um, or a little while later, I received another text from Bishop reminding me to stay calm, that it might seem as if our friends were getting out and we weren't, but we really would get to go home. There wasn't anywhere else for us to go but home, and I needed to remember to stay calm and carry on. <laughs> and immediately all anxiety left Michelle and me. We knew that we would indeed get home. So, um, so no, they were not random texts. He was very, very inspired to send that, that initial calming um, text. And I learned that every single text he sent had, there was a reason, and I'd better pay attention to it. And I, I really did. Um, now, the next day, we received a text from our friends telling us that Wyndham was evacuating all their guests from their three resorts via boat to Puerto Rico. And it, if we, and if we could be at the Margaritaville Resort at one o'clock, we would all be shuttled to the dock together and we could go with them since we were initially Wyndham guests. And we had an hour and a half to get there. So, do you want to talk about Kai a little bit, who he was? Okay, I said, there was a guy named Kai that was through the Red Cross <coughs> that he was kind of incognito because all the, the local people would talk to him and so he didn't have a Red Cross ja jacket so people would talk, and so he'd figure out if there was drug deals or anything going on, then he could stop it right there. So he became, like I said, we became friends with him. He did amazing. He just ran like Superman the whole time we were there. Like if <coughs> you needed a cot, whatever you needed, Kai was there. He was like our Superman every time that we'd we'd go, and like a friend there. So I mentioned to Kai that we had this opportunity to actually leave, um, and we had an hour and a half to get there. But I was very calm. I, not one panic moment did I have. I thought, if we're supposed to leave at that time, we will. If not, okay. Um, and he said, be ready to walk out, of, out the door in 45 minutes. He said, I'm going to find a ride for you. So he came over in 45 minutes and he said, walk out the door in five minutes. I said, and we were, everybody had been watching us. Like I said, every day that we were there at the shelter, there was things that were coming up missing from everybody. So, you know, we had to, one of us always had to stand guard watching our stuff. And so people were watching us. They were using our phones, trying to figure out how we were going to get out. Like we were letting them use our phones all over. And so everybody, we went quietly to grab our suitcase because we didn't want to cause, like, a riot, like we didn't want anyone to follow us or know where we were going. And... People are like, are you leaving? Are you leaving? I'm like, no, we're just yeah. going to go out in town and see what's out in the town. And we just kind of grabbed our bags With our quietly. <laughs> <laughs> so, so they wanted us to turn our cots over to say that we were gone, but we didn't want everybody to know that we were going to be gone because there were so many people watching us walk out the door. And so we just quietly just turned with our suitcases and walked down the street. And Kai was right behind saying, keep walking, keep walking past the shelter, keep going. Then he said, and get in that brown car right at, the, there. at the foot of the hill. I was like, serious? <laughs> that kind of scared us. Um, we trusted Kai, but, but it was scary out there. And then, um, and then as I pointed to the car, I said, that one? And he said, yeah. And then I saw the Red Cross vest um, sitting on the side, or on the passenger side of the car. And so I knew that it would be okay. So we hopped in. And then Michelle, talk about that. I said, so we were on, on our way back, trying to go to back to the resort that we were going to. And of course, the curfew had been, people were out from noon to six, people getting gas, groceries. It was crazy out there every way. So we get in a line to go <coughs> where we're going. And 
the, the traffic is stopped and she's like I don't know if there's a gas line I don't know if we're you know and we had a time frame that we had to be at that resort and she goes I don't, the driver said I don't know I don't think I'm going to make it so she said I'm we can try and we said if it's not safe for you you can just take us back to the shelter we don't want to endanger you just and she said no I got to get you there and so she kind of flipped around this through some parking lots and went a different way that there wasn't really even roads. It was like dirt, dirt roads and garbage. And every time she'd cross over something, she just prayed, you know, the tires wouldn't pop. And she was scared to death. And we didn't know where we were going either. And we were just, we kept saying, if you want to turn around, you can turn around. But she said, no, I've got to get you guys to your destination. And we just prayed and prayed. And then we got a text, right? Yes. We got, suddenly we got a new text from our friends telling us um, that the plans had changed and we needed to go to Red Hook instead and I was really nervous about telling our driver that the plans had changed and she had <laughs> risked her life to get us to the original plans and um, but I said we're supposed to go to Red Hook how far away is that and she just went it's right there it was like two minutes like two minutes like right we were right in front of it so it was like this miracle text right at that miracle moment so we she pulled in um, we but we tried to give her money. She didn't want to take anything. And then um, just as we were, you know, leaving, I threw money in through the window and said, this is for tires. And then we ran away really fast before she could <laughs> give it to her or, or give it back to us. And um, we got in line to get on the boat. The boat was there. We, we saw it. We knew where, where, um, what we were supposed to be doing. And... Um, you were, you were supposed to have a bracelet to get on that boat. You had to have a bracelet to get on, and our friends had our bracelets for us. But but at least we knew where the boat was, and how so many, we. How many days in after the hurricane was devastating? Mm. This is Tuesday night. It would be Tuesday night, so it's about a week. A week after the hurricane, so we um, we were standing in the line. And okay, seriously, I am never thirsty. I have never been thirsty much. I don't drink much. I just am never thirsty. All of a sudden, I thought, I am going to die. I, have, I am so thirsty, I have to have something to drink. We had lots of water, but we left everything we owned practically at the shelter. And I was just ready to rip water out of people's hands that I saw <laughs> in line, and I thought, oh, I can't do that. So I thought, I'll go around to the front, and maybe there'll be somebody there that has water, a couple of bottles, and I'll see if I can buy water from them, because I was desperate. And so I walked around the corner, and there were our friends standing there. And they, of course, we, you know, did the hug, and I grabbed her Diet Pepsi out of her Coke out of her hand and, and drank the whole thing. And, <laughs> and then at that moment, there was an announcement that the boat was full and another boat would come tomorrow and we were all supposed to go to Margaritaville in the same vehicles we, could, we had come in. <laughs> and it's like, okay, that sort of leaves us out. And then it started raining, just pouring down, so everybody just scattered to their vehicles, leaving kind of us. But um, the people that we, our, our friends, came with two other people, and they said that we could go back with them if we hurried. So threw our luggage in, there were, it was the back seat was for two people, there were four of us kind of piled on top of each other, but we were able to get back to Margaritaville. And, um, and we did stay there that night. I said we were able, I said, to get, they put us up in rooms and we were able, there was um, <coughs> electricity, but I said we had a, kind of a cold shower, which was nice because we hadn't showered in a week. So it was wonderful and heaven to us and just sitting outside relaxing. And of course I said the fans were supposed to work in our room, but our fan didn't work. So we were dying of, so we, they had to have the window, the doors opened up so there's no locks, cause the, you know, like a hotel key you use. So if you wanted the air to go through, you had to open up their door, and we were kind of afraid to have our doors open because we'd heard stories of people coming down. It wasn't a very secured uh, facility that we are in. And, of course, the lady next um, in the next morning said that she saw people with um, garbage bags 
doing I at the ice machines filling up ice and there was just people jumping over the fence all over and so it wasn't really protected and so we kind of tried to stay in our room and stay with people and we eventually did get off the island the next day we were able to um, to go by a boat to Puerto Rico we stayed there overnight um, Wyndham was was phenomenal with us we were allowed to stay for as long as we needed to till we could get flights out um, and we were there for for one night and then we were on our way home via Florida I said my, my husband I said we just said get us out of Puerto Rico I said everybody that kept saying just get out of Puerto no matter where you go and so as soon as we had phone communication again I called and he said I'm, I've got you on a flight the next day to Fort Lauderdale and I said have you been watching the news because there's a hurricane <laughs> that just hit that way and he said don't worry I said it's on the other side of the state it's not going to be a problem so I thought that's going to be great we'll go to Florida we'll sit by the pool for a day we'll decompress for a day that didn't work out for us so much that way <laughs> we drove up to the hotel there was a sign on the door saying um Towers due to, off. Due to the hurricane, they could not take any reservations. And so I'm like, well, I, I have a reservation here. And they said, I'm sorry, you'll have to call the Marriott. So we're both on the phone going, okay, who do we call? And each called a number and they said, I'm sorry, the whole state of Florida, there's been a hurricane. <laughs> and so I said, the whole state is booked out. Um, so they transferred me to their sister company. And then she said, I'm sorry, but there's no hotels available. So we decided the best route was going to be to go back to the airport because we didn't know what to do. And in the meantime, my husband, Kimball, had got online and found a hotel. And so he said, it's pretty close. Go. He said, there's not internet and there's not um, cable, but there's air conditioning and there's a bed. And so we thought, that's great. So we took it, paid another 40 bucks to go back to the hotel. And we got there and it was a scary, almost like pay by the hour kind of hotel. It's a really, really bad hotel. <laughs> we said, we're not staying here. So we thought. <laughs> and the, okay, and the reason why <laughs> I decided that would not be a good idea, <laughs> other than the obvious reason, was a couple of days before that, I got yet another text from the bishop saying that he felt like like um, he needed to just to tell me it would be a good idea if I could take a picture of my of our I, I, or of our passports and our driver's licenses, and then send them to um, either him or Sue or, or somebody else. Um, and so from that text, I thought, okay, this is a really really scary place to stay. We're not going to stay here. So they said we walked up the street a little bit. There was like a, <coughs> a bar and grill that was serving us, and it looked like they were like, and we hadn't eaten all day because we'd been on the airplane. So we said, let's just go sit down and figure out what we're going to do. So we sat down, and they had some chips and salsa, and we were trying to figure out, should we go back to the airport? What should we do? And there was a really nice lady at the restaurant who said, well, why don't you guys rent an Airbnb? Or, and we're like, well, how do we do that? If we, we'll stay anywhere you tell us to stay if it's not by this place, you know. <laughs> and uh, she spoke. Spent, we were there 45 minutes and she could never get through. Like I said, the phone lines, the power was out. So we decided that we were going to go back to the airport where there was air conditioning. We could plug our phones in and it was safe. So we took another taxi. Well, we said, could you call us a cab? We waited and waited and waited for 45 minutes and called another cab. And they said, oh, I'm sorry. It's going to be three hours before we can pick you guys up. And so we just ended up taking an, an Uber. Uber car, ended up going to the airport were ready to stay the whole night. There were lots and lots of people there because the cruise ships had just let everybody off to so that same been, time. They had been going around for three or four days, so all those people there had missed their flights. So, um, so we were going to all hunker down there, but then we were able to get a, a friend or a relative was able to get a place with them. So it was just like 15 minutes away, so we, we had a, a real bed, it was very, very nice. And then we ended up home, home. finally. <laughs> um, so, the, and again, the, we are so very, very grateful for everything that the Red Cross did for us. We know that there are lot, there were lots of um, needs that they have. Some needs they could fill, some needs they couldn't. 
But um, something that they all told us or asked us when we left was, please don't forget us. They didn't say, please send us money, please send us things. They said, don't please forget don't forget us. And we vowed that we would not forget them. And, and we are, we're raising donations. If anyone is interested, um, feel free to donate. It's not going to go to the Red Cross. It will be going to me or the branch, or, or the branch president. Um, it will be the branch president who will be meeting with the Red Cross shelter and will determine how the funds are going to be utilized. Everything out there was debris all outside walking around. Like I said, you had to be careful where you walked. There was things hanging. I'd have to get her out of the way because I said, there's a light hanging I, right there. Like, I was just oblivious to that. <laughs> I was just going right along. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, they were just very surreal. Like I said, that we felt like literally angels protected how they kept, how we, everything was blown off all around it. Like we couldn't figure out how in the world except divine intervention. There was no way anybody could survive that type of cataclysmic event. And I'm not saying that, yeah, we were protected just because of us, but I mean, everybody that, that goes through something like that, it's just, it's just incredible. It's... I said, I think the day that we left, they, and that wasn't just St. Thomas, but like I said, all of St. John got wiped out too. They said there was, they had counted 44 deaths when we had left. They were still counting, I mean, they were still, I said, still taking, I mean, one lady that came into the shelter the, the day or the night before we left had been, she was um, deaf, probably in her late 70s, lived alone, had been trapped in her house for three or four days, and there, you know, they couldn't take it, there, there was no hospital to take her to her, so she came here to the shelter, and we kind of took her under our wings, and... Yes, and and they were able to, they, they weathered it just fine. I mean, the... There was damage, lots of damage at all of the resorts, but we really felt like we were supposed to be where we were when we were there, and they needed to be where they were so that we could all actually get out. Um, it was a life-changing event. Michelle and I have both said numerous times, we are so grateful we had that experience, but we obviously never want to have it again. <laughs> Well, thank you, everybody, for coming. We certainly appreciate that. And we're not going to have a prayer because it seems really tacky to ask for money and then pray. So we're pretty much done. <laughs>